This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Uh, good evening. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. And um, what I'd like to start out with is kind of give you uh, where we're headed. And that is there's some interesting technology that's actually quite old, originated in, um, in Japan and uh, 50 years ago but uh, recently has gained uh, traction in, uh, in the United States. Um, and I'll, also I'll take you a little bit uh, uh, through a journey that I've had where I've uh, first gone to Japan to study under the experts, uh, but uh, a couple years ago uh, we, we had some ideas of how to build a better mousetrap. And uh, so my partner and I, uh, Sean Whalen, who's actually uh, in the, um, in the uh, entryway, um, he, he and I have uh, put our heads together and developed a uh, blood flow restriction product that uh, we think solves a lot of the problems that were, that were existing. So uh, with that, um, let's get going. One of the things to say is that how long we live and how well we live is a function of our genes and our environment. And since at, the, at least at the moment we can't change our genes, we need to optimize how we interact uh, with our environment to maximize health, wellness, and fitness. And, uh, you know, one of these days we're going to have some pill that we can take, but uh, there's problems with that kind of approach. Um, the first thing to say about wellness and health and fitness is that we have to live ethical lives, that we uh, are happy to uh, have the, the sunshine principle or, or to have, have what our acts are uh, exposed. So you have the Ten Commandments on the left-hand side, and you have the golden rule up on the right-hand side, and you have that other golden rule that really isn't uh, appropriate uh, uh, to contaminate the, contaminate the thing. So uh, once we have our ethics and honesty out of the way, then um, as general statements, the key to a long life, health and, fitness and wellness can be stated as do's and don'ts. Don't use tobacco, particularly cigarette smoking. Don't do drugs, particularly pertinent during this current opioid crisis. Don't ride motorcycles <laughs> or other risky physical behaviors. And what I mean by that is that there's, uh, in, particularly in sports, there, the participation in that sports may be fun and may be rewarding, uh, but there can be very serious long-term consequences. Uh, for example, as we see with uh, the concussion problems that NFL players have had, um, as well as uh, sports like alpine skiing or ski jumping that we'll see in a little bit, um, uh, race car driving, surfing, uh, these things have hazards that uh, can be fatal from time to time. On the other hand, what are the do's? Um, do alcohol in moderation and modestly. Um, <laughs> great. So, so there's a lot of epidemiologic data that uh, cultures that consume regular small amounts of alcohol actually live longer than those that either abstain or uh, uh, have excessive use of alcohol. Uh, same thing for nutrition. Um, balance and moderation are, are really the message here. And uh, so that's, that's an important uh, facet. And then what this talk is going to kind of focus on is do incorporate regular exercise into your lifestyle. And so uh, and this is kind of a cute little thing here where uh, this guy's challenging why this guy believes that regular exercise is aging, and he's 147. So, so what, happened, what happens when we age? Um, there's a lot of not necessarily good things. Uh, there's a reduction in CNS or brain function, cognitive function, and also in the ability of the brain to uh, control uh, what aspects that it has to deal with, for example, body parts moving in various ways. And uh, in the brain are what are called primary neurons, and then there are secondary neurons that uh, uh, take those commands to the muscles or information from the, in the peripheral nervous system, take it from the uh, tissues back to the brain. Um, 
There's a reduction in muscle fiber uh, number and size, as well as the contractile function of each one of these muscle fibers. Uh, there's a reduction in, ten in tendon tensile strength, uh, so much so that uh, it's possible with normal activity to rupture tendons. Um, there's a reduction in bone density, and we have a, a, a big medical problem with um, uh, particularly uh, senior women who uh, have uh, lost their bone density and uh, as a result uh, uh, end up having fractures, and, and uh, that carries its own morbidity and mortality. Uh, there's a reduction in capillary density, and this is the small blood vessels um, that uh, surround pretty much all tissues. And uh, this reduction in capillary density uh, prevents the um, delivery of blood and, and clearing of waste that, uh, that, it ha that happens when we're younger. Uh, and then um, there's a reduction in mitochondrial density, and, and uh, mitochondria are really the energy factories of the cells. And so ATP or intracellular phosphates are made in these mitochondria, and they power pretty much everything we do. And so if you look at from all the way up in the, in this case, the motor cortex, all the way down the brainstem, out to the muscle, and then here this is from the spinal cord, out to the muscle, and all each one of these fibers of a given motor unit are innervated by the motor neuron, and then this thing is connected to a tendon, and then there's a bone attached. This whole pathway uh, and various ways, of, of various places along the way uh, end up uh, degenerating over time and particularly if they're not used. So there's a little uh, truth to the uh, better use it or lose it idea. So kind of honing in on, on one aspect of this, and that is um, uh, the aging process where it has to do with motor neurons. And uh, there's a reduction in the number of myelinated nerve fibers. Myelin is, is a substance that coats a lot of, you can think of it as insulation in a wire, and when the, these wires are insulated, they, uh, their, their uh, conduction velocity is greater, and uh, uh, they're, just, they're basically better, quicker nerves. And uh, then there's a decrease in nerve fiber diameter that also is probably related to this decrease in myelin. Uh, and then at the neuromotor junction, which is depicted here, there is a decrease in the number of these presynaptic vesicles which carry the neurotransmitters. And then these neurotransmitter, these vesicles, when they come to the, when there's an electric, uh, their bioelectric uh, uh, charge coming down the thing, the, it releases the uh, acetylcholine into this kind of uh, uh, space or uh, uh, nerve gap. And uh, then on the other side of this, on the muscle, there's these nicotinic uh, receptors that uh, bind to the acetylcholine, and they then discharge the, uh, the muscle fiber. In addition to that, there's denervation of uh, the motor fibers. So all of these things go away, but then in some cases, the, actually the nerve uh, loses contact with the motor fiber, and then a lot of changes. A, a motor fiber or muscle fibers are very dependent on what kind of neural activity they're getting. And so when they become denervated, they just kind of shrivel up and uh, go away. Um, and then something that's, uh, that will be apparent um, a little bit later is this idea of converting fast twitch fibers or type 2 fibers into slow twitch fibers or type 1 fibers. So regular exercise can mitigate the age-associated changes to this neuromotor unit, but the intensity and duration of the exercise that is necessary to get these changes is rarely tolerated as we age. Um, then in addition, out of disuse, we have this kind of transition going on as, uh, in my case, you know, uh, uh, what I was 50 years ago is 50 pounds ago. So um, these, thing, these things do creep up on you. As we age, there is one event after another. Maybe you fell uh, alpine skiing on a nice vacation, which made you be sedentary for the next three months. Well, that three months of sedentary behavior caused a lot of the tissues to atrophy, and uh, 
uh, maybe gain some weight, and then you, when you try to get back, you're not, you're not able to do the things that you were able to do in the first place. So in addition to that, uh, we like to eat, and uh, we kinda, our appetite is more related to uh, our activity and stuff like that, but there's a lag phase so that when we become sedentary, uh, we don't necessarily lose our appetite, and so then now we, we're in a positive caloric balance over time, and uh, uh, that's uh, probably the main reason for this uh, increase in, in weight. So, um, we think we have a solution for that, and it's called blood flow restriction training. And uh, by restricting the blood flow and performing light, easy exercise that's doable, in a short amount of time, one can gain the health benefits of intense, long-duration exercise. And so one of the ways to think about this is that we have kind of short-circuited the body's normal systems. And I'll explain, I'll explain more of that uh, in detail as, as we go through this. But the key to all of these things is this disturbance of homeostasis in the working muscle. And what I mean by that is the environment that that muscle operates in becomes disturbed, and it goes out of ranges of pH, temperature, uh, a variety of other things that we'll, we'll mention briefly. Um, this disturbance of homeostasis is the thing that stimulates local and systemic anabolic mechanisms. And so this is kind of where this no pain, no gain idea comes from. You have to really stress yourself before the body will say, oh, I'm, I, I've got some problem here, I better react to it, I better get better so that I can continue doing things. And, and then further, because typically the exercise that it takes uh, to get this disturbance of homeostasis ends up doing damage by doing the restricting blood flow and light easy exercise, we don't get that damage, and so adaptation happens on a quicker time frame than, than usual. Um, here, this is a kind of a model of uh, the uh, uh, system that uh, uh, Sean and I have come up with, and there's a couple things to point out here. There's basically a pair of uh, arm bands, a pair of leg bands, uh, a little pump to inflate these things, and very importantly, there's an app that can guide the person through these things so that, in essence, you don't need an expert around to take you through this stuff. Um, B strong training systems are used by a wide variety of people from adolescents to elite athletes, injured or operated patients, to baby boomers, to nonagenarians, and everybody in between. And here, these guys aren't exactly adolescent. They're, they're 16 and 17 years old, but we use this down to uh, pretty much nine-year-olds. And on the other hand, here we have um, a young, young lady, 95 years old, who's got her bands on, and she's going for a walk with her walker. One of the things that is a really big problem that I think we can address is we have someone who's otherwise motivated to play sports, but their, their lifestyle between the job and family and work and everything else has just gotten to be so hectic that there's no time for them, even if they're motivated, to go out and do things. And then there's another group of uh, uh, general adults who uh, we could characterize as couch potatoes, and um, uh, they end up developing metabolic syndrome, what's something called metabolic syndrome, which is uh, high blood sugars, high uh, cholesterol, uh, high blood pressure, and, um, and obesity. And this is an entirely preventable uh, problem by regular exercise alone, along with some good new nutrition um, modulation. So we, one of the things here is if we get back to this idea that regular exercise can fix these things, then we... Uh, but in many cases, regular exercise is too intense for people to do enough of to get the benefits. We've now figured out a way to shortcut that and to provide this uh, exercise stimulus in a way that's doable for people. So one of the things to say is uh, anytime you're going to do something to another human, you want to make sure that you're safe. And uh, blood flow restriction training in one form or another has been practiced for 50 years in Japan 
Today, today there are approximately 300,000 blood flow restriction se sessions daily in Japan with no reports of serious complications. And this means that there's just a fantastic experience, and if there was going to be something bad happening, it would happen in this kind of population. In our particular situation, we've basically had uh, systems that we've had out for uh, approximately a year to a year and a half. Uh, we currently have approximately 1,500 systems out there, and for us, we've had tens of thousands of sessions uh, with Be Strong uh, and no reports of any serious untoward effects. There's a reason for that, and that is that the only way to get really serious effects is by occluding arterial inflow. So when you put our bands on, we want to make sure that what we're doing is we're adjusting the circulation in just the right way to optimize the effects. And for many of the other devices, um, some of them, for example, started out life as surgical tourniquets, which are very good at occluding arteries, so you don't have bleeding all over the place. Um, they, they have to go through quite a rigorous thing to avoid uh, this uh, occlusion of the arterial inflow. And, um, and, and their way of doing this is they end up tethering you to a stand where there's, where there's a uh, Doppler um, uh, flow meter that assures that uh, flow is never uh, totally occluded. Um, but anyway, so if, if, you can, if you do shut off blood flow to, for an extended period of time and some other things happen, it's possible to do uh, severe muscle damage, and the end of that spectrum is something called rhabdomyolysis, and uh, that can end up uh, putting you in, re in renal failure, uh, needing to go on dialysis, or uh, it can cause uh, arrhythmias, cardiac arrhythmias, which can lead to death. Uh, in addition, it's possible to get deep venous thrombosis or DVTs, and then these DVTs can migrate into the lungs and cause pulmonary emboli, which also can be fatal. So as long as we stay away from occluding the arteries, we're in good shape. Um, so we have designed these things specifically not to occlude the arterial inflow and by uh, up to the maximum capacity of our hand pumps. So this way we're eminently safe and the safest BFR devices on the market. One of the other things to say is that in you know, safe in comparison to what? Where we get the same results you get from really heavy lifting with very trivial light exercises. And this is, well, this guy's not 90 yet, but he's 87. And uh, uh, this weight looks like it's going to fall on his, on his foot or uh, hurt his back. And uh, this little ball's not going to do much. So blood flow restriction training is safer than the standard kind of training that we had out there. So now let's get into a little bit of the mechanism, because it, it's, it's not quite straightforward. But the, the, obviously, with blood flow restriction training, we want to restrict blood flow. Uh, but we want to do it in a specific way. What we want to do is, at rest, we want to block the veins from blood getting out of the extremity. But if you just block the veins and then let things go their way, first the, the, the um, a limb would engorge or distend with blood that's coming in from the artery and nothing's getting out. And if that went on long enough, the artery would stop because there's no more room to put anything in. Uh, so... Then what we have is we have this muscle contraction. So when you do, uh, when you do a muscle contraction, you're actually squeezing what's blood in, the blood in the muscle and you're sending it somewhere. And because of the valve system in the veins, the, where it goes is it, oh, it, oh, overgoes, or it, it overflows the uh, uh, venous blockade and you end up changing the character of the venous flow from what I kind of call a lazy river, where it's kind of continuous, to one in which it's blocked for a period of time, and then with muscle contraction, all of a sudden, all this blood is pushed out of the extremity, and so you actually get uh, almost pulsatile venous flows going from zero to very high rates. And this actually is, is preventative for any kind of clot formation, because what you're doing is you're flushing this thing out repeatedly and keeping the thing moving. But in, in many ways, what we've done is we've just slowed down and inhibited 
the blood flow so that when, when we have this situation, the exercising muscle is not going to get the blood it normally gets nor needs to continue uh, contractions. Um, this, is, this is the bit again about uh, what we do is we actually, by putting these bands on, we don't really change resting flows, but normally when you go from rest to exercise, the arterial inflow picks up and we're really preventing that increase from happening. And uh, then to uh, all said and done, this, these ch vascular changes uh, result in an angiogenic stimulus, building more and better blood vessels. And uh, I'll show you some data later on that uh, uh, kind of uh, indicates this. So the working muscle, the bottom line is the working muscle is denied the blood flow it normally needs to sustain this, these contractions. So what happens in this muscle? Now this is where the disturbance of homeostasis takes place. And I'll show you some information about the amount of oxygen in the muscle goes down, the pH or the amount of uh, the pH goes down, the amount of acidity goes up, and the pho the intracellular phosphate stores are are depleted. In addition, the uh, lactic acid uh, is increased as well as inorganic phosphate, which is a breakdown product from these intracellular phosphates. Taken together, these changes produce a metabolic crisis, which has several main consequences. As these early motor units fatigue, faster and bigger, bigger units must take over the work, eventually leading to all, recruitment of all muscle fibers in a muscle. And this is actually important, because um, generally for there, you can divide the world into type 1 fibers and type 2 fibers, or slow twitch and fast twitch, and normally when we're doing everyday activities, we're relying on our slow twitch muscle. And that, those fibers being activated are very dependent on the blood supply. And uh, you go along, you're a happy camper, and you're able to do work. Um, but if you're doing intense exercise or heavy weight lifting or long duration things like marathons, you end up needing to tap into these uh, faster twitch fibers. And the only way that those fibers get trained is by having contractions. So when you're thinking of explosive sports or uh, very, very big strength-oriented tasks, you need to use all the fibers in the muscle uh, to do this. And uh, um, so it's very hard to recruit these. Uh, but we found a way by restricting the blood flow that we start having these... Uh, um, faster and bigger units have to take over the work because the, the easy ones or the early ones have dropped out. And so this leads to recruit, total recruitment of all fibers of the muscle. Also, these, this disturbance of homeostasis stimulates local protein synthesis in an attempt to repair the damage that's being done. And in addition, the cell surface, uh, is, uh, anabolic cell surface receptors are upregulated so that now this muscle fiber has these little catcher's mitts on, on its surface looking for anabolic hormones to come by and activate even more protein synthesis. In addition, uh, this signal of distress is sent to the CNS versus uh, a kind of afferent nerve fibers called group 3 and group 4. So we'll get into a little bit of this here. This is, this is a technique called near-infrared spectroscopy. If for those of you who have been in a hospital setting and somebody has put a little pulse oximeter on your finger to see that you're saturated with oxygen on the arterial side um, here, uh, this is the same sort of thing, but instead of looking at, at moving blood, this is looking at uh, hemoglobin that is in the muscle itself. So, these numbers give you an idea of what's called SMO2 or the saturation of oxygen in the muscle, so in a percent thing. And so here we have uh, just regular exercise, doing arm curls, and normal levels of oxygen in muscle at rest are about, let's say, 65%. And then you start doing exercise, and it drops down in the mid-30s. And then you stop and rest a little bit, and it comes back up. And this, this kind of goes back and forth here, but you kind of see the baseline as you get warmed up, you actually don't go down as far, and you, when you recover, you're going up even higher. And then when you really stop, you've got this recovery hyperemia where you have very high levels of oxygen um, in the muscle. 
If you do that with blood flow restriction bands on, uh, we're starting out more or less in the same place again, and then you just put the pressure into the band, and all of a sudden it, it's dropped the oxygen with, even out without a, any exercise. And here we, we continue on with some of the exercise, and now instead of in the mid-30s, we're in the mid-20s. We, increase the pre we continue to increase the pressure, and uh, the muscle gets worse and worse, and before you know it, we're really down in the basement. This is extreme hypoxia, which is a very good stimulus for, uh, number one, causing a disturbance homeostasis, and number two, um, uh, stimulating protein synthesis. This is some other data from nuclear magnetic, spec excuse me, nuclear magnetic spectroscopy and, and identifying this sort of thing. If you look over here, this is, uh, these are spectra that go from, uh, without any kind of blood flow restriction, uh, from rest to exercise. And what you see is that inorganic phosphate peak is increased from rest to exercise, and the phosphocreatin peak is severely reduced, indicating uh, uh, this kind of use of uh, phosphate in the muscle or the AT ATP. And here's, these are the... Uh, curves for ATP, and they're down a little bit as well after exercise. But then if you uh, restrict the blood flow to this muscle, now all of a sudden the inorganic phosphate peak is much higher, and the remaining phosphocreatin is much lower than the comparable thing where blood flow is going on, and uh, you still have the uh, ATP curves uh, showing, showing degeneration. So between the last slide and this one, this shows that, that muscle with blood flow restriction training gets very hypoxic and ru basically runs out of its energy stores. Now, so this gets back to what, this, uh, what the consequences of those kind of things. So when the PO2 gets to a certain point and when the energy stores empty out, then that, those muscle fibers that are working, they just stop, they fail. They can't do it anymore. And that is the typical kind of thing that you see over here. These are arm curls, tricep extensions. But then as these fibers drop out, you start recruiting faster and faster and faster fibers, still using the same easy weights. And before you know it, you're getting into the same fiber populations that you're using with very explosive, powerful movements. Kind of depicting this thing in another way, the typical way for recruitment and fatigue pattern is if you use light weights or you increase the weight and increase the weight, you get more and more of these fibers contracting until you need to use very heavy weights and near maximal weights to contract all of the uh, fibers in the muscle. Blood flow, re blood flow restriction recruitment and fatigue pattern is such where the weight stays the same but because we have restricted the blood flow, now these early fibers, they start to drop out, and you recruit faster and faster fibers. And before you know it, with light weights, you're recruiting the same percentage of fibers in the muscle that you are with really heavy weights. And this, this is actually one of the big take-home points, that es essentially we can become trained with very light weights and blood flow restriction to the same extent that you can with heavy weights. So this is, this is a little bit more of the mechanism. This is the mTOR pathway. Uh, the thing to point out here is that the uh, reduction in energy stores and the reduction in oxygen or hypoxia are very strong stimuli in this pathway to activate the mTOR pathway that ends up resulting in protein synthesis. In addition, these cell surface receptors are activated and upregulated, so they're looking for growth factors to come along and and amplify the process. So what we really have, the next aspect of this, uh, it, and by the way, um, the point of showing this slide is that uh, our bands go anywhere and can be used anytime. Um, she's actually doing uh, uh, handstand push-ups, which is quite remarkable. Um, and on top of that, she's 57 years old. She happens to be my wife, but. <laughs> um, 
So there's something called a systemic neuroimmunohormonal response or an anabolic response. And, and, and by triggering this, this disturbance of homeostasis message is sent up to the brain and the brain then releases this systemic response. And uh, there's autonomic hormones and anabolic hormones that, that end up then going throughout the body. And that will be important in some of the data that I show a little later. So this systemic response amplifies these local responses to upregulate protein synthesis. And any muscles that were exercising, whether their blood flow was restricted or not, adapt to this situation. Because little damage was done, there's an increase in strength and fitness very quickly. So if, if you think of all of our processes, it's a balance between breakdown and buildup. And in, under normal training circumstances, we get some breakdown along with the stimuli to build up, and things pretty much progress. If, for example, you uh, end up uh, getting a trip to the space station, then all of a sudden uh, the buildup stops because you're not doing any exercise, but the breakdown, uh, the body recognizes that it doesn't need all, the, all these things that are up there, so you end up losing bone density, you lose uh, blood volume, you lose muscle mass, you lose cardiac mass um, just by spending uh, two weeks on a, on a space shuttle mission. So anyhow, whoops, let's see. Uh, so uh, what we have here is that this balance between breakdown and uh, uh, buildup is altered in favor of building up, and so the changes that occur happen readily and, and r on a relatively quick time scale. So for example, as few as five sessions of blood flow restriction training can end up prompting an increase in, in strength and fitness. So um, again, I had stressed this earlier, all tissues that were involved in the exercise, whether they were proximal or distal to the blood flow restriction bands, uh, enjoy this systemic anabolic action. So this is, this is a kind of a cartoon that depicts this problem. So here's this muscle doing arm curls with a blood flow restriction band in place. And, and this disturbance of homeostasis is being communicated uh, through metaboreceptors all the way up into the brain, rattles around up here for a while, and there comes out a sympathetic uh, response that uh, increases sweating, increases heart rate, increases breathing, and... Uh, uh, that's one thing, but in addition, there's a uh, uh, reflex that ends up uh, uh, through the hypothalamus and, and then into the pituitary, uh, releasing a number of anabolic hormones, inc including growth hormone, that then again go throughout the body. And this, this basically shows this. And here we have, this is uh, whole blood lactate, and the open squares are the control exercise where it's just exercise alone. And then with the same exercise but the blood flow restriction bands in place, you have a, a much more or a highly significant Im increase in blood lactate. And lactate itself is st stimulates protein synthesis in the, in the tissues that it's, it's being generated. In addition, coming back to some of these vascular changes, here we see that VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor, is stimulated by uh, the blood flow restriction training, which, which you see in the, in the closed or filled in uh, circles here, compared to the control exercise itself. And these two things are uh, basically local effects, or examples of the local effect that we were talking about earlier. But then now here we have the systemic effect. So here this is... This is growth hormone, and the control exercise, or the same exercise, when there's no blood flow restriction bands in place, uh, has this nice little gray line, and basically nothing's moving. And here, uh, this is before the exercise, this is after the blood flow resistance restrict restriction training, and here you have at 10 minutes and at 30 minutes, very robust increases in growth hormone production. And this growth hormone then goes and you know, in, among other places, to the liver, where it stimulates an increase in IGF-1 or insulin growth factor 1, uh, which is also a very anabolic uh, substrate. So taken together, here you have some indications of a local effect 
and also evidence of a systemic effect that is highly anabolic. So that's nice, and that's a nice story, but how does this really apply, and how, how, do, we, how do we actually make this happen? And um, on January 10th, 2014, uh, this is one of my athletes not having a good day. And um, he ended up breaking his arm, and he has a comminuted humeral head fracture, and you can kind of see there's like five different pieces here. And he also broke a rib. He also had a bit of a head injury, and he tore the labrum of his rotator cuff. So here's the, where the labrum would normally be. And essentially what he did is, in this particular piece, is this is where a muscle called a subscapularis um, inserts, and so he just ripped that all, whole thing all, all out. And uh, this happened on a Friday in Germany. Uh, he flew back to Park City, Utah on, on Saturday, and he saw our shoulder orthopod on Sunday. And um, the, uh, the doc said, you know, Todd, you know, this, this I, I really need to go in there and put some screws and plates in there, and I need to fix it. But if that's the case, you're not going to the Olympics. And Todd had been, from the date of this thing, this is 2014, so the opening ceremonies for the Sochi Olympics were February 7th, 2014. Four weeks from the time of this injury. And um, normally this kind of thing is a season-ending injury. Uh, if he was operated on, it would be six months rehabilitation under normal circumstances. Well, Todd didn't like that answer, and I had been uh, uh, working with uh, this stuff. This actually was with uh, the Katsu uh, equipment, and um, we said, okay, well, let's give Katsu a try, and if it doesn't work, then you can go put your screws in, and uh, his season's ruined anyway, but this is the only way that we might be able to get him back to compete in the Olympics, and this... Todd is, uh, at this time, is 37 years old. This would be his sixth Olympic Games and uh, uh, most likely his last one. So uh, he wanted to do everything he could to, uh, to make the team. And so what we did is we started twice a day. Todd was used to working out twice a day. So now, and as is typical with any injury, all of a sudden you, you have to stop what you're normally doing. And... Uh, um, that is very hard on these athletes. There's a lot of atrophy that happens when, when that occurs. And even if we got his shoulder to heal, the time off from normal training that would happen in the, his time period would ruin any kind of performance that he might have in the Olympics. And so here we're doing... Uh, basically what we do is with any injury, we want to train all three normal extremities as much as possible while not causing any problems with the uh, healing site. So he's immobilized in a sling, and you can kind of see here he's got a hand grip in his left hand, and so he's actually doing forearm exercise while he's doing a pulling motion with his um, right arm. And, and one of the keys to this kind of exercise is that it's exhaustive. And uh, this is exhaustion from the, from the exercise as opposed to anything in his shoulder. And Todd is what's called a Nordic combined athlete. And so he ski jumps and he cross country skis. And here he's practicing what he would be doing with his, uh, on, a, on a ski jump, but with the bands on and his shoulder immobilized in a way that we're not causing any pain in the, in the shoulder. And then similarly, uh, here we have on our, we have a treadmill you can roller ski on uh, that simulates cross-country skiing. And, uh, it's, and normally he'd be using poles, but he can't on his left side. And so we're doing exhaustive intervals with, uh, um, with this kind of thing. And these, these workouts are exhaustive, but they're not, if he were doing a normal kind of thing, they wouldn't be tolerated. Long story short, the opening ceremonies were on February 7th, and Todd was elected flag bearer for the United States team. 
And just to annoy me, he's carrying the flag in both his right and left arm. <laughs> and we were following him along with x-rays. So this was three days after the opening ceremonies in Sochi. And we got a regular x-ray. And you can see this, this piece is not where it's supposed to be. But what is amazing is we're starting to see uh, callus formation and ossification across the fracture, main fracture site. And so this is really early healing. And why would that be? One of the principles is we immobilize the fracture. We don't move it so it has the best chance of healing. But we feel that this systemic response that we elicit by this very hard, intense exercise produces a hormonal milieu which, which optimizes the rate of healing. And to further illustrate this, this is now February 12th, and here he is uh, doing an uh, Olympic practice jump. And, um, and his left arm is not doing exactly what the right is, but if you remember, when, when you try to heal these fractures, you have to internally rotate and fix the arm here. But if you try to go off a ski jump with your arm like this, you'd probably do the same thing on, on the other side that he did in the first place. So over time, we had to externally rotate the arm and be able to put it back so that he could uh, get into a normal jumping position. And all of this stuff we did without any pain in the fracture site. This is a week later, and now we still, it's even, but there's now even more bone uh, healing that's going across this fracture site. And he has no pain in his shoulder, and he's able to cross country ski, and he's able to ski jump. So then on February 20th, 40 days after the injury, he ends up placing well in the uh, jump portion of the Nordic Combined competition. And he skis five kilometers. The, the event was a five-kilometer cross-country ski race, which under the best conditions he might do in uh, 12 minutes and 10 seconds or 12 minutes and 15 seconds. And he was able to complete it in 12 minutes and 28 seconds. And the, the, basically, this is unheard of progress in a very short time frame to be able to be competitive in an Olympic Games with a uh, fracture as he, uh, an injury as he had. So that was kind of that's kind of the dramatic kind of uh, application that we have, and now let's look at some of the um, literature about this. So this is an article that came out in the Journal of Applied Physiology in the year 2000, and I want to kind of go through these graphs in detail. Um, what we have here on the x-axis is the basically the speed of the movement, and on the y-axis the amount of torque generated. So, um, and where you have negative speeds, that's extension of the arm. Where you have positive speeds, it's, uh, it's flexion of the arm. And what you see here is if you take, if you take uh, an untrained control group and you test them twice with four weeks in between, they basically have no change and it's a very reproducible test. <coughs> so now going on the other side of this, this is standard weight training. This is about using 80% of a one rep max. Uh, it's a bit of an artificial situation, but uh, it's typical along with the kind of recommendations that we get for normal strength training. And here we have the pre-training values, and then what we see is at all, at all speeds, there's a significant improvement in strength or torque generation uh, with standard uh, heavy lifting or high intensity training. Then on the other hand, uh, if we use low intensity training, and instead of 80% of one rep of maximum, we use 30 to 40% of maximum. Uh, here we have not much is happening. There's a little bit of an increase, but basically easy weight, weight training really doesn't cut it in terms of improving strength. But if we add blood flow restriction to the same weights that were added here, now all of a sudden we have the same kind of advantages that we get with the heavy lifting. So you saw that graph where the Olympic lifter was kind of losing control of the weight. That kind of training compared to the stuff that 87 year old guy was doing with a big exercise ball, you end up getting the same percent improvements in, in strength. This is an amazing finding 
to be able to use very light training that doesn't really, that's possible for particularly seniors, and uh, to get these dramatic improvements in, in strength. Um, another study that recently came out uh, showing essentially the same thing is now this is with high school students and they were doing back squats and uh, the conditions here are they had uh, low intensity work less than 30 percent of one of one repetition maximum or heavy work greater than 65 percent of one repetition maximum or the combination of this kind of weight training plus BFR and what you see here is that the low intensity weight training with the BFR actually has a robust improvement in the amount of weight that they could move pre and post test uh, where light weights by themselves did nothing and you had a, a good but not as good uh, improvement in strength with the uh, heavy weights by themselves. And this is consistent. This, this is the same kind of results that we got on that first slide that I showed you. And uh, the, again, the reason for this probable difference, it, the reason it's even better, is because we're not doing damage to the tissue when we're working it out. And so you don't have to kind of repair the damage that was done before you can go on and, and, and do more. So not only that, here we have this on, on the x-axis here are days. And they were doing a BFR workout once a day. And what you see is compared to the same weights, light training alone, but light training with katsu, there was an, in, there was an increase in the muscle bone cross-sectional area that is happening very rapidly. And so this is, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. By a week, they had actually uh, gotten to significant gains uh, compared to the control situation. So very quick thing. And that, that is also consistent with this idea that we're not doing the damage, so we don't have to repair the damage first and then get better. We're getting better right from the get-go. And um, here we have something else that is kind of unusual. This is where they're doing a, a bench press, one, rep, uh, one repetition maximum, and here's the percent change in strength. And this is... Um, basically uh, light weight training. And then this is the same training with, um, with the BFR. But what's interesting here is you use both your pecs and your triceps to do a bench press. The triceps have their blood flow restricted, but the pecs don't. They're, you're the, they're well above the thing. And both of these muscles are showing improvements in strength and improvements in cross-sectional area. So now, so here we have improvements in strength and in size of muscle from this. Uh, muscle is attached to bone. And here we have, uh, in, a, in a different study, they were studying leg press. And they had, uh, uh, with Katsu, they had a, a nice improvement in, in, in leg strength uh, over control where there was really no change. And in thigh cross-sectional muscle, uh, again, a, a nice significant improvement in thigh cross-sectional um, area of muscle compared to the control. But then also we have a significant improvement in, in bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. And this is an enzyme that's used in bone turnover. And when this is going up, it means that something's happening to the bone and, it, and uh, um, indicating that there's, there's increased bone turnover and likely... In improved uh, bone density as a result of this. Um, here's IGF-1. In this case, it's not statistically different, but still a, uh, in it, in an increase. So now we have positive changes in muscle. We have positive changes in bone. And we have positive changes in um, uh, building new and better blood vessels. What we have here is mRNA expression on this axis. And these are markers for vascular endothelial growth factor. It's receptor, uh, something called HIF1-alpha, which is a hypoxable inducible factor. And then various um, isoforms of the nitric oxide synthase system, which is also all of these things are involved in um, uh, uh, building new blood vessels. And so these, the... What you have here is, a, is the open bars are with blood flow restriction training and the black 
uh, with the same kind of weights, but no restriction. Another kind of neat study, and of all places coming out of Iran, um, but basically what they did is they took these poor little rats and they tied off their femoral arteries, okay? And then they made them run on treadmills. And so this is their model for restrictive uh, blood flow training. And what you see, these are, this is an indication of muscle hypertrophy. Uh, what they did is they sacrificed the rats after a few sessions, and, and then they measured the ratio of the size of, in this case, the soleus muscle and the EDL, or extensor digitorum longus muscle, uh, in these rats. And this, this uh, sixth condition over here is... Uh, uh, treadmill walking or jogging on a, on a little rat treadmill with, with the blood flow restriction conditions, where these things are various control situations. And uh, this, this one over here, this third graph here, is uh, just blood flow restriction alone without the treadmill walking. So, but here we have very significant results with a form of blood flow restriction training um, in these rats. And then also we have... Uh, the receptor for the neural transmission of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And if you recall back on that slide where I was talking about what's happening to the motor nerves, um, this is indication that these, these um, receptors are coming back. And you're increasing the receptors with this form of blood flow restriction training. And I, and I must say that when you tie off the femoral artery in a rat, it doesn't mean the, the whole thing dies. It just means that their blood flow is restricted. They're not able to get the normal amount of uh, blood flow with, uh, with exercise that they otherwise would. So this is in a rat model, and this is showing that the same kind of thing is happening in rats um, to, as to people. So now uh, we've had a, tr a tremendous experience with this sort of stuff. And uh, this is some of the different kinds of people that we're working with. Uh, this guy uh, had a bad knee injury from playing soccer. And uh, you can see here he's doing arm work. And it's hard to see here, but this, this is, his right leg is in a, is in a, um, uh, is in a stocking that, uh, that he's using to keep down swelling in the injured side. This gentleman was in the Pentagon on uh, um, September 11th, and he's also a uh, Iraq and Afghan, uh, Afghanistan uh, veteran, and uh, he has uh, post-traumatic uh, uh, stress syndrome, and he ends up claiming that this is the only way that he gets some of his relief. Um, this guy... Uh, has two things going on. One is at one point he had a uh, PRP and stem cell ejection in, in his shoulder. Uh, for sh he happens to be 81. And he also had a total knee replacement. And uh, uh, so this is a very good uh, therapy for uh, total joint replacement as well as some of these things. This, this young man had... Uh, um, low back pain, and he had an MRI that showed there's these discs bulging into his spine, and, and uh, his orthopedic surgeon uh, said, well, we should operate on this, and we should take him out. Uh, in the meantime, he showed up at our clinic, and uh, he ended up doing a B-Strong program, and then he was scheduled for surgery. He dutifully went down and was on the gurney, and, and uh, he, he goes, wait a minute, doc, I don't think I need this anymore. And the guy says, what are you talking about? And he says, well, here, look. And he got off the gurney and goes, bends over and touches his toes and says, my back's not hurting. And the surgeon says, get out of here. And so uh, in, in, in literally the two weeks between the time he, made his, he had his appointment with the orthopedic surgeon and the time that uh, he was due to be operated on, uh, we were able to take his pain away. Uh, this is an example of using four bands in, in training in an in a otherwise healthy young woman. And this, this young man had, uh, had rotator cuff repair surgery. And again, showing the same sorts of uh, kind of things. So the theme here is that almost no matter what's wrong with you, we end up being able to uh, uh, address it with blood flow restriction training. These are actually two nurses 
And this one happens to suffer from osteoarthritis and this one from rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the, doing the B-Strong system got her out of the wheelchair. Uh, she has eliminated the pain that she normally has in her hands. And uh, so it's effective for that kind of thing. And in addition, this kind of easy lifting or strength training is something that's possible for these women, where the normal kind of training that you might want to do to improve this kind of strength is just impossible to do. Um, more of these cases, this, this, this guy is 83, and he had uh, a uh, sol shoulder repair. Uh, she's in her mid-50s, and same sort of thing. And you'll notice that uh, in many of these cases, there's bands on both arms and legs at the same time. Uh, this guy um, had uh, ankle surgery and uh, uh, was interested in getting his golf swing back. And uh, we were able to uh, allow him where before with his foot, he, he was in so much pain that he, he couldn't do anything, got operated on. And then to rehab him, we ended up uh, using... Uh, uh, these Alter G treadmills in the back, as well as the Be Strong, and now he's playing better than he ever has. Again, here's our here's one of our guys um, doing more vigorous exercise with the uh, bands on, and this is the total knee replacement, one of the, our total joint. Uh, this young lady had uh, low back pain and ends up not having it anymore. He had a rotator cuff repair and a total knee replacement. So here's also some fascinating things. This, this is one of our women jumpers who had a fall and she had a fracture in her thoracic spine. Uh, she did not have any spinal cord uh, damage at the time, uh, but we were doing the Be Strong exercises that she could tolerate without having the... the um, her fracture hurt, and uh, she's now back to normal. This young man over here um, is in his mid-60s, and he had a cardiac arrhythmia. The long story ended up, uh, he was taken to the um, uh, cardiac surgery thing, and he had, he had a median sternotomy where they opened up his chest to uh, uh, repair what was going on. And uh, in addition... He has ankylosing spondylitis of the neck. And before he was doing the Be Strong stuff and before he had his cardiac surgery, he, his, his head was bent over. He could not uh, um, uh, get his neck into this normal position. And uh, we we're able to, again, uh, doing exercise gently that didn't disturb the healing tissues, we were able to uh, bring him around. This guy in the middle... Is a was a complete quadriplegic, and and he had he had suffered a uh, he was surfing and he ended up getting dumped on his on his on his head uh, on the bottom of the, of the Pacific Ocean, and uh, he was for two years he was uh, in a spinal uh, cord injury rehab unit and unable to walk and everything else. And little by little, uh, it wasn't a complete lesion, but we were able to bring him back. And with doing this, and, and I don't know if you saw this, but we take these things to absolute exhaustion and failure. And so he's really working it there. And uh, we were able to get him back so that he's just walking as, as normal. So in addition, this stuff is... is is good for any kind of exercise. It just amplifies the, the effect. Here is roller skiing on the treadmill again with all four bands on, cycling with leg bands on. And in this uh, little video, this is uh, swimming in the Pacific with the bands on. And uh, so uh, this, these blood are be strong cuffs. Uh, that we don't want them to inhibit the normal technique that's being used, and, but they, they go anywhere in any kind of environment. Uh, some more cases. Both these are cases of ACL repairs, and in this case, a professional uh, 
uh, goalkeeper for the New York uh, City uh, Football Club. And in this case over here, uh, Ted Ligeti is one of our Olympic gold medalists in, uh, in um, skiing. This is, this is doing these kind of easy exercises, and it's, it's his left knee that had the ACL replaced. And this is two weeks after the surgery. And you can kind of see that his, his legs are about the same size. That's kind of unheard of. Um, same thing for Ted here. The character of this stuff is that these are um, very exhaustive exercise. This, is, this simulates his, his alpine skiing where it, uh, basically you're flying down these slopes on a very unstable surface and you have to use a lot of muscles to do this. But you couldn't ask, ask him to go alpine skiing right now because it would likely tear up his repair. Um, but here we can take him to exhaustion uh, in a protected way and uh, um, get him back to uh, doing this kind of stuff. So um, here we have one more of these things, and this is uh, when it's used as a training device. Uh, she's not particularly hurt here, but we have an alpine ski simulator, and doing it with the band on just magnifies the difficulty of the uh, work, and here she is bent over, exhausted. Uh, she's another one of our gold medalists. So... Okay, how do, you, how, do you, how do you make this thing work? So our prescription is basically a 20-minute whole-body BFR exercise session three times a week, first thing in the morning before the day starts getting away from us, and in the convenience of your own home. So it's very convenient. It's before you take a shower. It's, everything's going on. And, uh, or you can take your Be Strong kit and the TheraBand, and you can do this anytime, anywhere, whenever you happen to be, whether you're on the road, whether you're over in Europe, whether you're at the office or at home. And so you recover quickly from these kind of workouts, even though they're exhaustive, you recover quickly so you can manage the other things that are going on in your day. So the product that we made is affordable, it's easy to use, it's comfortable, it's time efficient, effective, and above all, it's safe. Here we have uh, the same thing that basically is saying the s same sort of message where we basically take these bands that are suited for you, we use light loads, and by working mu these muscles, we end up getting this um, uh, systemic response and we don't get the damage that uh, it would otherwise take to do that. There's a couple of uh, higher-end systems. This is Katsu and this is something called uh, uh, Delphi. And these things are in the thousands of dollars, where ours are in the hundreds of dollars. And then there's a lot of uh, uh, little wraps and straps and all sorts of things out there. They are affordable, uh, but they're unlikely to be safe and they're unlikely to be effective uh, compared to uh, our situation where we have this controlled with a pump and uh, an app to, to guide you through it. So it's a pretty s simple process. Our app can be obtained at app.gobestrong.com and uh, you put the bands on and then you do uh, generally um, you're looking to get muscular failure in 15 to 20 minutes and the general protocol is three sets of 15 to 30 reps and doing it on three to five different exercises. So in summary, uh, B-Strong BFR is safe. There are no contraindications to a B-Strong BFR session other than ongoing medical emergencies and you ought to go to the hospital if you're having a heart attack. Um, for recent injuries or operations, train the three uninvolved extremities normally and exercise the injured or operated tissue gently without pain. Be strong, BFR works. BFR is, ex is effective in improving strength and fitness, even when normal training methods are not possible, as in Todd's case. Blood flow restriction training can improve all tissues from the nerve to the muscle to the blood vessels to the bone. Um, here we have 
Be, be Strong BFR is portable, comfortable, and convenient, able to be used with any exercise. Be Strong can be done anywhere, anytime, without additional equipment. Be Strong BFR is a promising solution for everyone to reap the benefits of regular exercise. And we th like to think of it as a great anti-aging me me medicine. And with that, thank you for your attention, and we'll take some questions. Yeah, let's use the microphone and then. Hi, I enjoyed your presentation. I do have a question. Once you stop doing this training, how long do the results persist? Um, I would say similar to um, other sorts of training. So if you stop doing whatever, generally in two weeks, you've lost a lot of the effect that you've gotten. Okay. So. There is a question up here. So if I uh, have my normal weightlifting routine, I could use these straps and use the same weights, and then I would have to go down in weights to get the benefit. So what I would recommend is that you put the bands on, and then you take uh, approximately 30% or 33% of the weights you normally use and do the, do the same exercises, and uh, you'll get the same benefits with a third less weight and less wear and tear and in a shorter period of time. But the key to all these workouts is going to failure. And it's hard to go to failure with heavy weights. You lose control of the weight and drop it on your foot or somewhere. What is the relationship of occlusion pressure to central venous pressure? Um, well, there's a couple ways of answering that. So firstly, if we, if we take the condition of having a band on your arm, the pressures that are inside the inflatable part are way higher than any kind of venous pressure. So, so let's say it's a, your venous pressure at the level of your heart standing up is approximately 40 millimeters of mercury. The pressures that we put in the bands uh, on the arms can go up to 300. But that's the pressure that's in the inflatable cuff. That's not exactly the pressure that's impinging on that vein. And what we do is we find ways that we find the balance between mean arterial pressure and mean venous pressure such that when they're at rest, we're occluding the venous side, but we're allowing the arterial side to stay patent. And then what happens is when you have muscle contraction, that pressure generated by the muscle overwhelms the venous occlusion and causes a return of the venous blood to the heart. So um, we really don't have any, it's hard to get pressure measurements right at, at these things. We could try to do that with putting in some catheters and pressure sensors, but we really haven't done that. We empirically are able to see that we maintain arterial inflow. We have, you put these bands on and you check your pulse and you've got a pulse so the artery's patent. And we know that uh, from the engorgement of the, of the veins on the venous side that we are distending the venous side, but that we, we know we empty it and we overcome the venous blockade with uh, muscle contraction. Two more questions. Yeah. You've talked about strength and muscle mass. Uh, what about the effects of this kind of training on endurance? On, on the what? On I'm endurance. Sorry. Oh, endurance. Uh, yes, uh, there actually are two publications which show that uh, by doing a program like this, you can improve VO2 max. Uh, there was a very nice study that was done in the August Krogh Institute in Denmark where they basically put femoral artery and femoral vein catheters into uh, a uh, subject who was doing uh, uh, bicycle exercise and measuring the blood flow that was going in there and the oxygen consumption. If you have arterial and venous blood gases, you can see what the oxygen uptake was and that a program of blood flow restriction training improved the oxygen uptake out of that muscle. So um, it's likely, or the way that we would do this is that if you're, like in those Iranian rats, the idea was that they had these rats walking on a treadmill. They improved their treadmill walking performance by, by doing this and uh, even with, the, with their femoral arteries tied off. So um, 
I would say that the kind of training you do dictates the kind of benefits you get. So a lot of this started out with weightlifting, so you get better at weightlifting. When you're doing this stuff, in a, whether it's cycling or running or cross-country skiing or speed skating, you get better at these uh, endurance events. One more question. I get in trouble whoever I choose. Here. I know, super, thanks. Well, and I, I had a multi-prong question, and so I'll answer whichever parts you have time for. I thought one of the citations, I thought maybe it said 2000, so I wondered if some of the research had been around for that long, and if that's the case, you know, I just, I, I think this is super, imp I mean, super exciting, super impressive results, and so um, why hasn't it been picked up in mainstream? Why don't we hear about more professional teams excellent, excellent engaging question. it, professional triathletes, other athletes? And, um, and then do you know of any place locally where there's physical therapy or some place where it's available other than for home use? Yeah, great questions. Um, you're very right. Uh, that first, um, that study I showed you on efficacy where you had the four panels with the weightlifting, that was published in the journal Applied Physiology in the year 2000 by the Japanese group that was doing this. Uh, since then, it's been, uh, this technique has not really gotten out of Japan for many, many years. It was really not until 2007 or 8 that it really started getting into North America. Uh, people poo-pooed it, and they said, well, this can't work, and blah, 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 blah. And, and then there's another complication that, because they couldn't get a hold of the Japanese equipment, they started using their own stuff, and they weren't getting the same results that the Japanese were getting with their stuff. And so it's, it's just starting now, I would say, starting in a, about 2012, it started to gain some traction in North America. Um, we happen to have all sorts of this gear outside in the lobby. So, uh, and we've written, our, we've written our app such that you don't need to have some expert to help you with it. So we feel that it's a self-contained uh, situation uh, right here, and all you need is a credit card. <laughs> all right. On that uh, happy note, let's thank our speaker. All right. Thank you.